So now the cemeteries are everywhere, some 170 in this salient alone, neat and regular, with their gates and walls and entrances like Roman camps, much neater and more orderly than the suburbs and factory farms they now find themselves among. As if the dead are here to garrison the living, with the countryside not caring, though the place names aren't hazed over at all, and each location is immaculately signposted. The cemeteries are so thick on the ground that we can't find Larchwood, and eventually end up down a cul-de-sac at Hill 60, the slight vantage point south of the town that changed hands many times during the fighting. Now it's a bare muddy common, with a stone telling its history, and a memorial to the dead left entombed in its burrows. There is a car park and a homemade museum cum cafe, with vases made out of shell cases and a pin table. Bungalows back onto the common, with garden sheds. One has a carport and a Peugeot in the drive. Rustic wooden seats denote the desolate place a picnic area, though nothing much grows. Grass the permanent casualty, the ground as brown and bare as an end of the season gold mouth. Was it for this the clay grew tall, for the plastic flowers in the picture windows, the fisherman with his van, and a boy riding over the ancient humps of trenches on his BMX bike? Well, yes, I suppose it was. Unable still to find our cemetery, we give it up and drive back into Yip and eat a waffle in a chocolate shop, where plump businessmen dally with the proprietress while choosing pralines for the weekend. They go back to the office, tiny boxes of chocolates dangling from one finger, while we drive out on the Menin Road in the rain. Eventually we spot the tip of a cross across a sloping field. There is a railway, and there are trees which may be larches, and here is the signpost, broken off by a tractor and lying in the ditch. The cemetery is over a crossing on the far side of a single track railway. There is a gate, a long finger of lawn alongside the railway, another gate and the burial ground proper. Uncle Clarence's stone, the stone which is not his grave, is in a row backing onto the railway. Known to be buried in this cemetery, C7-044, Rifleman C.E. Peel, King's Royal Rifle Corps, 21st of October 1917. Their glory shall not be blotted out. To one side is a Gunner Hucklesby of the Royal Field Artillery, to the other a Private Oliver of the Hampshires. It is like seeing who is in the next bed in a barrack room. Many of the names are from Leeds, a Private Smallwood, a Private Seed from Kirkstall Road, some with family details, some not. Uncle Clarence is not. A second Lieutenant Broderick from Farnley. At thirty-five, a bit old for the war. Like Woe's crouch back, another uncle. Sergeant Fortune, a character out of Hardy. Private Rookledge of the Wellingtons. Private Leaver's Edge of the Yorkshires. Rugged names, which had their owners been spared, one feels the years might have smoothed out to end up Rutledge and Liversidge. Many Canadians known only to God. The low walls are sharp and new-looking, unblurred by creeper. There is no lichen on the gravestones, the dead seeming not to have fertilised the ground so much as sterilised it. This is April and too soon to mow, yet the grass is neat and shorn. Standard at the entrance to each graveyard is a small cupboard in the wall, the door of bronze. In it is lodged the register of graves, in this and adjacent centimetres. Larchwood is a modest example, with only some three hundred graves. The register begins by describing the history of the place. On the north-east side of the railway line to Menin, between the hamlets of Verbranden Molen and Zwarvelden, was a small plantation of larches, and a cemetery was made at the north end of this wood. It was begun in April 1915, and used by troops holding this sector until April 1918. The town is simple, almost epic. 
It might be a translation from Livy. The troops, any troops, in any war. There is a plan of the graves, drawn up like an order of battle. These soldiers laid in the earth, still in military formation, with the graves set in files, and groups at a slight angle to one another, as if they were companies waiting for some last advance. All face east, the direction of the enemy, and only incidentally of God. I sit in the brick pavilion, looking at the register. The book is neat. So much is neat now, when nothing was neat then. It is on finger marks, not even dog-eared. It might be drawn from the Bodleian Library, not from a cupboard in a wall, in the middle of a field. Of course, if this foreign field were forever England, the bronze door would have long since been wrenched off the gates, nicked, skins and Chelsea sprayed over all. The notion of a register so freely available would in England seem ingenuous nonsense. I sit there wondering about this, never knowing if our barbarism denotes vigour or decay. Across the hedgeless fields are the rebuilt towers of Ypres, looking, behind a line of willows, oddly like Oxford. At which point, with a heavy symbolism, that in a film would elicit a sophisticated groan, a mirage jet scorches low over the fields. For all the dead who lie here, and the filthy, futile deaths they died, it is still hard to suppress a twinge of imperial pride, partly to be put down to the design of these silent cities, the work of Blomfield, Baker and Lutyens, the last architects of empire. The other feeling, less ambiguous here than it would be in a cemetery of the Second War, is anger. Nobody could say now why these men died. The phrase, their glory shall not be blotted out, was a contribution by Kipling, who served on the War Graves Commission. This is the Friday after President Reagan's Libyan venture, and to assert that there is anything under the sun that will not be blotted out seems quite hopeful. We instinctively think of the conflict between East and West on the model of the Second War, the one with a purpose. The instructive parallel is with the first.